So uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us sort of across time zones uh, to be with us this you know, morning or evening or whatever it may be for you. Uh, my name is Nathan Wilsey. I'm a PhD candidate at Stony Brook University, and I'm involved with the Crustacean Task Force. And these webinars are a product of the Crustacean Task Force, which is itself this joint effort from the uh, Environmental Defense Fund, LENFEST, as well as our university. And we're sort of tasked with bringing together individuals with expertise on crustacean fisheries in China, Indonesia, the Philippines, as well as the United States. And so this is sort of the second in a series of webinars, uh, which we've drafted to address important topics in crustacean fisheries. For this particular webinar, we have invited these expert panelists to discuss the performance of crustacean fisheries across their representative regions as well as some of the challenges and potential opportunities uh, in fisheries management, conservation, and research within these fisheries. So to give a sort of a quick overview for our viewers uh, about the format of the webinar, we've prepared some background questions uh, to give our viewers some perspective on the scale and importance of crustacean fisheries across these nations that our panelists represent. Our panelists will take turns answering these prompts across five categories each from the perspective of their own experience and country. The second of this component of this webinar uh, will depend on you. So these panelists will be answering your questions about the topics presented or any other relevant questions on international crustacean fisheries. So I encourage you, the viewer, uh, to submit any questions you have in the question and answer box uh, at any point in the presentation. And uh, we have some curators who will direct relevant questions to the panelists here uh, once the second part of the webinar begins. Uh, now I could take a moment to uh, introduce our four panelists, although we're still working on getting the last one in here. Um, but to begin, uh, we have Sri Ernawati, uh, who currently works at the Research Institute for Marine Fisheries within the Indonesian Ministry of Marine Affairs as a senior researcher in the field of fisheries resources and environment. Uh, they are actively involved with the science team developing the harvest strategy for blue swimming crab in Indonesian archipelagic waters. And they collaborate with a variety of international research efforts beyond our own, uh, such as the U.S. Sustainable Ecosystem Advance Project and with Australian CSIRO. Jose Inglés uh, provides strategic advice and thought leadership to the Environmental Defense Fund Philippines branch, mainstreaming science through capacity building frameworks to generate science support. Uh, for fisheries policy reform. Prior to this, uh, he worked as a researcher and later as a member of the Faculty of Marine Fisheries and Oceanography at the University of UP Visayas, as well as a consultant for WWF in the Philippines uh, and in the Coral Triangle countries. Cody Zawalski is a scientist at NOAA Alaska Fishery Science Center in Seattle. Uh, his primary duties at NOAA include writing stock assessments for crab in the Bering Sea, as well as serving on the Crab Management Committee and evaluating assessment and management techniques uh, for different potential climate change outcomes for these species. Uh, our final speaker, uh, hopefully when they join us, is Song Ling Wang, uh, who is a 2021 Pew Fellow, as well as the founder and president of the Qingdao Marine Conservation Society, uh, which is a Chinese conservation and sustainable seafood NGO. Song Lin has over 15 years experience in the field of China's marine ecosystem, uh, as well as protection and sustainable seafood movement. So, pardon me for a moment. So let's, I guess, get started on our first question slot. Uh, so here we're gonna try and sort of set the stage uh, and ask each panelist to generally represent their critical fisheries. Uh, so some of these uh, introductory questions, you know, what species make up the most important crustacean fisheries for your country? Uh, what proportion of the total fisheries output is made up by crustacean fisheries? How are the fisheries distributed across the world? And why are these four countries that we represent uh, among the largest crustacean producers? Uh, and what are some of the biggest challenges and opportunities in developing sustainable crustacean fisheries in your country or just in general? Uh, I, maybe I'll ask Cody to speak first, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure thing. Um, 
I guess in terms of species, uh, lobster, Dungeness crab, shrimp, snow crab, blue crab, red king crab are the big species that we deal with. Um, of the top 30 fisheries by value in the US, 12 of them are crustaceans. Um, they account for maybe 15% of the landings by weight, but around 40% by value. So they're uh, a disproportionately valuable sector of the fisheries industry. Um, your other questions were tough. Why, why are the four countries represented among the largest crustacean producers was a tricky one. And I, I figure it probably has something to do with um, developed infrastructure for ground fish fisheries and, and fin fish. And at least in my neck of the woods, I think going forward, um, climate change is going to be one of the trickiest things that we're going to deal with. And I'll probably talk a little bit later about uh, the management meeting that I just came from last week, um, talking about the, the impacts of a changing environment in Alaska on our stocks. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll let the, the next person down the line take it from there, I suppose. Great. Um, Jose, would you like to go next? Okay, uh, thank you, Nathan. Okay, what species uh, are the most uh, important to study in fisheries? I think in Indonesia, uh, there are several important species, uh, such as for shrimp. Uh, there are Penis meriguensis and Penis morodon, which represent from a wild stock and little Penis faname from uh, aquaculture fishery, of course. And then for crabs, uh, there are blue swimming crab, or, or we call Fortunus pelagicus. Uh, mud crab is Sila serrata and Sila faramomosin. And then our uh, first pineal lobster is dominated by uh, Panoris ornatus and also Panoris homarus. And then what proportion uh, are made up uh, by crustacean fisheries? Uh, I think uh, uh, based on U UN comes rate in 2019, Indonesia crustacean, uh, shrimp, crabs, uh, lobster, uh, contribute uh, around 17% uh, to world trade. And then furthermore, uh, based on Indonesia research product export statistic in 2019, uh, crustacea contribute uh, to approximately 20% uh, of Indonesia total fisheries export volume, uh, consists of shrimp 70%, 17%, I mean, and crabs 2%, lobster to uh, lobster 1%. And then the, this is uh, coming from wild and also from aquaculture fisheries. And it also gives about 43% of Indonesia uh, fishery fisheries export revenue are around uh, 2.1 billion US dollar. And then for the what are the four countries represented among the largest crustacean production? Uh, I think this is a very hard question uh, for me, but uh, I think uh, Indonesia uh, waters is suitable for crustacean habitats such as mangrove, seagrass, estuaries, and of course uh, rivers, which are as key habitats for crustacean. And in addition, uh, high precipitation, rich volcanic soil, uh, which is supplied uh, nutrient on the sea and also a willing system provides sufficient nutri nutrition uh, that needs for the crustaceans. And um, as additional information, the crustacean is distributed across the Indonesian marine in inland waters. And for marine waters, uh, for making easier fisheries management, it is divided into 11 fisheries management areas. And also for the inland waters, we divided into 14 fisheries management area. And what are some of the biggest uh, challenges and opportunity uh, for developing sustainable crystal ASEAN? Uh, I think uh, maybe for the challenges, uh, we know that uh, crustacean for fishery mostly uh, in Indonesia is small scale uh, fisheries. And in small scale fisheries, uh, fishing activity are mostly for livelihood and landing based distribute across the shorelines, which leading to pickled. Uh, difficulty on the landing data collection. And then uh, furthermore, uh, there is also limited knowledge and experiences of government and business in terms of business management. Uh, hence, uh, it is need to change the behavior uh, to practice sustainable uh, fishing. And in general, uh, governance capacity is some of countries uh, to establish uh, effective management it is not optimal due to a uh, low priority, low funding, low skill personnel, institution, and et cetera. And as a result, uh, 
management agencies find difficulties to monitor and enforce fisheries uh, at sea and at landing sites. And for the opportunities, uh, I think uh, we know that uh, no migratory species in crustacean. So we encourage local government to manage their uh, fishery through uh, local community based management, for example, uh, within fisheries management council of fisheries uh, of East fisheries management area. And of course, in coordination uh, with the national government. Terrific, thank you for your thorough response. Um, so again, this is just sort of just to kind of give us all uh, a little bit of a background on the, the methodology of crustacean management in some of these different species. So we're going to build on this and this next sort of batch of questions is uh, meant to address the economic and social impacts of these uh, important crustacean fisheries. So. Uh, to ask, what is the relative social distribution of crustacean fisheries? Um, you know, is the fishery divided between subsistence, uh, domestic consumption, uh, or is it mostly for foreign export? And how do you see this trajectory changing? Uh, what roles do crustacean fisheries play in food security, economic development, and community building um, in your country? And are the socioeconomic values of crustacean fisheries fully realized in your country? And so what are sort of maybe some of the untapped opportunities um, within this country? And uh, I've heard that Feng Lin has made it here with us, uh, which is great news. So uh, I'll give him a moment to, uh, to get situated and maybe Cody can start with us again. Well, thank you, uh, Nathan, and uh, I really apologize for this. Uh linkage uh, difficulties, probably uh, uh, some challenge of the hotel uh, connection uh, this morning. So oh, well. finally in, fully relieved. Uh, it's no problem. Glad to have you here now. Did you want to let Song Lin reply to the, the Certainly. previous uh, yeah, questions? Since, but... since you have the floor, um, do you have any remarks you'd like to make about these questions? Uh, sure. Uh, Thanks, Cody. Uh, so the, uh, for the question about uh, uh, social distribution of uh, crustacean uh, fisheries, uh, well, I think uh, uh, in the uh, case of uh, uh, waters around uh, China, the uh, uh, crustacean, uh, different crustacean species and, uh, and the fishing areas are uh, uh, more or less for different uh, fishers groups. So, uh, for the subsistence uh, fishers or small artisanal uh, fishers, they uh, typically fish uh, within uh, 12 nautical miles uh, offshore uh, of the coast. So these waters are governed by uh, uh, provincial and local uh, level governments, and they use uh, much smaller uh, fishing gears. And uh, in this area, uh, in this uh, uh, near shore water, uh, the uh, industrial colors are prohibited uh, from operating. So the uh, artisanal of fishers primarily targeting uh, this uh, very inshore, nearshore species, like uh, from the very tiny aesthetic shrimp, which makes uh, the largest single uh, crustacean catch uh, to some uh, mantis shrimp and multiple uh, stone crabs, uh, swimming crabs. Uh, whereas for the uh, offshore water uh, of the 12 nautical miles, roughly, uh, from the shoreline, uh, these are the domestic uh, fishing uh, fisher operations. And, uh, and then in the uh, even, and uh, they target uh, some more market, uh, migratory uh, species, uh, uh, like some, uh, and some deeper water uh, shrimp. Uh, including some prawns and some uh, red mud shrimp and southern rough skin. Uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, pretty much the case. Uh, so uh, regarding the uh, role of uh, crustaceans in food security, uh, so right now uh, uh, the total wild caught crustacean fishery uh, contribute to uh, around uh, 17 to 20% uh, of the 
uh, the total official kind of officially recorded uh, marine uh, fishery landings. Uh, so they uh, uh, and then uh, they are certainly they are extremely important for uh, fishers' job security uh, and for uh, uh, micro uh, providing micro nutrients. Uh, but I, I would say for wild uh, crustacean fisheries, they are. Uh, uh, because they are, uh, they tend to fetch a mid to high price uh, for at least for most of the larger uh, crab and the shrimp species, and then th they tend to be treated more as a delicacy uh, as opposed to st staple seafood. Uh, uh, so they, uh, particularly if uh, you compare the wild shrimp to the uh, kind of a over a million tons of a farm shrimp, uh, their contribution is probably. Uh, much lower for food security it itself, although for income and nutrients, uh, that's that's tremendous. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much I uh, want to cover for these uh, uh, few questions. Sure, thank you. Uh, Cody, are you prepared now? Sure thing, sure thing. Um, I think for, this is probably the area of, of the, the biggest difference between the U.S. and uh, the other panelists involved, and I'll speak to Alaska in particular, the situation differs around the country, um, but in Alaska there are currently about a hundred boats that fish the, um, the different crab fisheries, and it, it works under a quota system that was enacted in the, the mid-2000s, and the with the initial aid which with rationalization which is what we call the the change to the quota system in alaska um, the fleet decreased by about two-thirds so it used to be about 300 boats um, so the i guess the benefits that um, are derived from the the crustacean fisheries the crab fisheries in particular in alaska are fairly concentrated um, and they are, I guess they in Alaska, it's just 1% per of the landings in total coming out of the Bering Sea um, are from crustacean fisheries, but it's maybe 13, 14% of the value in recent years. Um, in addition to the 100 boats, the processing sector is also important, but there are about 12 processing plants that are they're operating right now. So it's a uh, still a relatively concentrated um, system compared to those that I've seen in China and, and elsewhere. <clears throat> I think um, with the last question you asked about where are um, opportunities for more fully realizing the, the benefits, um, particularly calling out over-exploitation. And I, in Alaska, the, the fisheries are managed relatively conservatively. Um, and even in spite of this relatively conservative management, we're, we're looking at stocks that have been declining in recent years. Um, and just snow crab is one of the assessments that I write. Um, this last week, we spent hours talking about data that just came out that tracked the stock from going to the highest we've ever seen it three years ago to the lowest we've ever seen it this year. Um, why that happened is still something that we're grappling with, but uh, it's, it was very um, troubling, I guess, for both the scientists and, and the industry. And it's uh, um, a difficult scientific question that we're going to try to explain in the next couple of years. Certainly, that sounds, uh, of course, extremely challenging. Uh, Jose, would you like to have a crack at our prompts? Oh, yeah, thank you, Nathan. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, most of our crustacean fisheries are basically uh, uh, supported by the small scale fisheries. We talk about uh, blue crabs, we talk about uh, the collection of, of uh, seeds for uh, mud crab that supports the aquaculture industry. They are all, uh, you know, livelihood of a lot of people. In terms of domestic consumption, though, uh, I think uh, people are, are more uh, 
they would rather sell their touch and they would rather sell their uh, their products rather than uh, eat them because these are highly valuable and they could uh, bring a lot more uh, uh, to 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 the income. Uh, our blue crabs is uh, primarily for exports. It's exported mainly to the U.S. Uh, uh, and it's, I think, uh, the fourth highest uh, export earners in the country, um, mainly in the form of, uh, you know, semi-processed. Uh, so some started and canning already, but uh, also a small percentage are exported as a social crabs destined for the uh, American market. So on the second question, on uh, I think that I answered this uh, while answering the first question of economic development and uh, and uh, community building. So basically, uh, the both crabs, the blue crab and the uh, mud crab, are are um, basically the, the triggers of economic development in the community. Similarly, but uh, uh, not uh, not heard of uh, or not popular is the collection of the suggested streams. These are like your krill type that are collected both by commercial and uh, small scale uh, fishers. And these are consumed uh, raw. Uh, they, uh, sorry, these are consumed by, by uh, local people. And the commercial scale are also exported, uh, including uh, the processing of most of this uh, suggested shrimp into shrimp paste. And, they're exported mainly to, uh, to cater to the needs of the Filipinos uh, abroad, which is about uh, 10, 000, 10 million people. So basically, the socioeconomic values of crustaceans are not yet fully realized. Um, I think we need to really look into the depletion of our resources. We need to really understand how the supply, uh, supply chain works or the value chain because we believe that because this is an export, most of the profits are, are, are earned, are, are going to the exporters rather than to, uh, than to the benefits of those that collect them. And exploitation, because we don't have any, uh, you know, from uh, regulations. So we are suffering from uh, over exploitation in all our fisheries resources. Wow, so uh, certainly have your management work cut out for you then, uh, improving some of those outcomes. Uh, Tree or Nawadi, would you like to make any remarks? Uh, okay, thank you, Nathan. Uh, okay, what's the relative social distribution of research and business? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I think uh, given the broad focus on crustacean and not just a single species, uh, this will be very diverse as certain species are mostly for domestic and only few for export, uh, around 19% of total production. And then while others, uh, for example, uh, blue swimming crabs are predominantly uh, for export. And then uh, what roles do crustacean fishes play in food security, economic development and community building in my country? Uh, I think uh, related food security is already mentioned before that Highly percentage is to cover domestic consumption, around 80%, and also uh, contribute as a large source of foreign exchange from the fisheries sector, uh, especially shrimp and blue swimming crab. Uh, it is known that uh, crustacean fisheries in Indonesia have an important role, which is able to absorb a lot of labor in their supply chain process food capture and aquaculture fishery and, and this is generally small scale fisheries. And in Indonesia, uh, main, uh, the total number, uh, as additional information, uh, the total number of fishers uh, reach around 2.3 million consisting of uh, full-time fishers and main part-time fishers and part-time fishers. And from crustacean fishery, it is estimated that the number of fishers uh, is around 10% of the total fishers in Indonesia. And regarding the uh, our socioeconomic value of certain fishers fully realized in my country, uh, uh, generally uh, Indonesia lacks a comprehensive data collection for social and economics information. Uh, social economics value, I think, is not realized. Uh, 
e.g. some commodities uh, still have issues in product handle, handling and processing. And then uh, meanwhile, regarding the over exploitation issue, uh, it is recognized that uh, crustacean fisheries in several uh, management fisheries, uh, fisheries management areas uh, have been found to be overfishing. Uh, this is based on a ministry uh, decree number 15, uh, 2017. Uh, this is include shrimps, uh, blue swimming crab, uh, mud crab, and also for lobster. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, and if nobody has any, any further remarks uh, for this prompt, we can move on. I wanted to bring to the attention of our uh, viewers that someone has answered some of the questions from the initial prompt in the chat. So if you're feeling a, a little behind the ball on the state of crustacean fisheries in China, uh, be sure to read through that. So obviously, uh, as we've already heard a little bit about, balancing fisheries and conservation goals can be extremely challenging. Um, and this is, of course, a problem for every country uh, that our panelists are from. Uh, so to sort of untangle a little bit of this uh, interconnectedness between conservation, ecology, and uh, fisheries landings, uh, what would you say are the biggest conservation challenges related to crustacean fisheries? Uh, what are the key next steps that we would need to take from the perspective of your representative countries uh, to balance the socioeconomic needs with the needs of conservation? And finally, how can we enhance both the, the socioeconomic benefits as well as conservation outcomes uh, through crustacean fisheries management? Um, Bir Nawadi, would you like to go first? So you'll get the first crack at yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Okay, Thank sure. You. Mm, uh, what are the biggest conservation? Okay, uh, I think there are some challenges in crustacean conservation. Uh, that uh, there are uh, first maybe uh, maintaining the spawning potential of crustacean resource maybe for uh, at the level twenty percent of spawning stock by mass, and then the strengthening implementation only limiting fishing effort to achieve uh, sustainability maybe. And then mostly uh, in Indonesia, uh, marine protected area is designed in Indonesia for benthic habitat uh, conservation, for example, coral reef and tourism. Uh, and there are non uh, MPA developed for crustacean conservation. And now Indonesia initiates uh, initiate one, initiates one for MPA dedicated for juvenile. Uh, blue swimming crab in Lampung province. And uh, next question, uh, the main next steps are to balance uh, socioeconomic needs and conservation. Uh, I think uh, at the moment, uh, Indonesia government has established a blue swimming crab uh, fisheries management plan and also have a strategy uh, that uh, balances the needs of uh, the socioeconomics and conservation. Uh, but uh, however, uh, it still needs uh, technical guidance document for the implementations. And next question, how could we enhance both social economy? Okay, uh, uh, I think uh, enhancing both social economic benefits on the, cons on the conservation and the conservation outcomes uh, can be done maybe through several ways. Uh, for example, first, uh, improving the values along the supply chain, uh, such as uh, reduce waste, and then second, uh, design and implement uh, implement feasible management system in the fishery uh, that are widely socialized, and that fishers and supply chain actors uh, understand and are aware of it. And then third, uh, I think, uh, Ensuring adequate enforcement and compliance mechanism are in place. Uh, next, uh, maybe a developing suitable management measures uh, to protect critical habitats or for crustaceans, uh, including local communities-based management, uh, better co-management and inclusion of officers and communities in management decision. And maybe the last is 
encouraging more price uh, transparency along the supply chain, for example, from first buyer to the uh, the retail in the destination market, and to ensure visas uh, receive fair prices for larger crustaceans to reduce the capture of uh, juveniles. I think this is my answer. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting to hear about uh, sort of getting better community involvement in some of these decision makings. Uh, and of course, you, you talked about MPAs, which is, you know, we could have a whole webinar on that in itself. And we may actually as the next in our series of uh, crustacean task force webinars. So very excited for you to talk about that. Um, maybe Son Ling would like to go next. You are still muted. Sure, thank you, uh, Nathan. Nathan, uh, well, I will uh, primarily take the first uh, question. What, what are the uh, key uh, conservation uh, challenges? Uh, so right now, uh, the, uh, within China, the, uh, uh, a huge challenge is uh, excessive uh, fishing effort and, uh, and a wide uh, pervasive use of uh, unselective and even destructive uh, fishing gears. Uh, particularly uh, bottom trawl uh, uh, and other uh, uh, like dragon, uh, uh, very long uh, uh, dragon nets uh, that are fishing uh, with a rather fine uh, small mesh sizes that are, uh, that are unselectively fishing uh, not only crustaceans but, but also uh, the, the mersal uh, fish species. Uh, with a high level of uh, ju uh, juvenile mortality uh, of both shellfish and, and fish. So this is a, uh, a huge uh, conservation challenge that uh, uh, probably the, the largest uh, we have to address. Uh, then there's also a combination of uh, uh, excessive uh, uh, fishing effort, fishing pressure uh, fueled by uh, uh, harmful uh, fishing subsidies, although this might uh, have a uh, fast or dramatic change or uh, improvement uh, in the near future. And uh, there are uh, also uh, pervasive IUU fishing for uh, in both uh, the MERSO uh, EEZ fisheries and, and the uh, inshore uh, uh, artisanal fisheries uh, as well. Uh, and that will also need to be uh, improved with a much stronger monitor control surveillance. And, uh, and, uh, and also there's a shortage of uh, uh, species uh, stock uh, con specific conservation measures uh, that need to be guided by uh, stronger uh, natural and social economic sciences. Uh, and also uh, because of the, uh, the way uh, uh, how the uh, commercially important crustaceans are, uh, are fished, so bycatch of uh, endangered, threatened, protected species, uh, including sea turtles, uh, like uh, seahorses, and uh, even some uh, shark and ray uh, species, uh, uh, are uh, their bycatch are rather uh, usual or not un uncommon in some of our surveys. Uh, uh, and also this, uh, there's a need to better protect uh, the critical sensitive uh, habitats so, uh, so I'm also a big fan of uh, uh, protected areas that can uh, that need not uh, that uh, that doesn't need to be or have to be no take zones uh, that they can be uh, some better uh, kind of spatial management to protect uh, uh, to uh, protect uh, certain sensitive uh, sea floors. Uh, valuable to crustaceans uh, as valuable crustacean habitats uh, from destructive fishing method. And uh, there's a possibility to push uh, for, for the mainstream of a, a turtle extruder device. Uh, and certainly there, uh, it's always good to set, set aside some uh, areas as a, a permanent uh, marine protected areas. Uh, uh, I think we need a very kind of a combined, uh, comprehensive solution, uh, again, guided by the best uh, science and data available. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank Nathan. you. Um, yes, working uh, you know, in, in Maine with uh, endangered right whales, I can confirm endangered species interactions are certainly a uh, global problem. Uh, Jose, would you care to speak next? 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, on the first question, what are the biggest uh, conservation challenges? I think uh, it's the rebuilding of stacks of gar crustacean fisheries, not only because they are source of food for our capture fisheries, but are also sources of, of seeds for our aquaculture industry. And to do this, uh, very often we forget that, uh, you know, rebuilding, uh, managing your crustacean fisheries entail the management and rehabilitation of your coastal habitats as well, be it for shrimps, be it for mud crabs, uh, or the blue crabs. You see, uh, shrimps and, man uh, and mud crabs, for example, are highly dependent on the mangrove areas. And uh, the, the, the conversion of many of our mangrove swamps into fish funds have demolished our shrimp fisheries, the capture fisheries. Today, uh, uh, the mud crabs are actually one of the emerging uh, commodities, uh, species that are being exploited for their seeds, for their young crablets. But this cannot go on because even if the government are rehabilitating mangroves, for example, they're planting the wrong species. And that does not sit well with the life, uh, the biology and ecology of our mud crabs. Similarly for your blue crab, for example, most of their megalopa stages are spent on the seagrass beds for settlement and nursery. So there are, uh, these are obvious things, uh, but the difficulty here and the greater challenge would be that resources management for your crustaceans uh, uh, deal with a, another agency, whereas your uh, rehabilitation and protection of your coastal habitats belong to another agency. They need to come together, sit down and really plan on how to work together to, to rehabilitate our crustacean fisheries. Okay. Um, the second question on what are the key steps that we must take to balance our socioeconomic needs and the needs of conservation? I think, I think uh, it, that aspect of the nexus of making sure that when we rebuild our crustacean fisheries, you also have to make sure that you have sufficient seeds coming from, uh, from uh, the wild to support uh, the, the uh, aquaculture industry. And this is very important. We're doing it for, uh, for mud crabs. Um, for shrimps, we are catching the, uh, the brooders as, as our broodstock for our uh, hatchery operations. Um, and interestingly, for example, uh, we, we do get a lot of, uh, we do get a lot of uh, uh, lobsters, phylosomal lobsters from the Pacific. What about my parents? They land in the eastern part of the Philippines, but the question is, there's a, there's there's the, there's the need to really harvest them as phylosoma and sell them for export. You know, the Vietnamese are buying all of them, or just let them settle, which is their natural uh, life cycle anyway. But they could not settle because uh, because our, the conditions of our coral reef areas, the conditions of our coastal habitats are so depleted so that they could not provide the, the requirements uh, uh, for them to grow. So it's a balance between how, which, which direction will the government go? Is it for, for socioeconomic or, or for conservation or both? And that is a big question we have to, to, to really answer in the, next, uh, uh, in the next years. And the third question, how do we enhance both socioeconomic benefits? You know, the biggest, uh, the biggest stumbling block, not just for crustacean fisheries in the country, is that if you're a producer, you do not dictate the price. It's always the buyer's price that dominates. And this is very detrimental to our producers, okay? Especially for high value species like, uh, like your crustaceans. They get, you know, just a piecemeal, a small percentage of the benefits that should accrue them. But most of our benefits now are you know, going to the exporters. And most of the benefits are going into the consumers and in, in, uh, export destination countries. So we need to really look at that and see how we could, um, you know, at the EDF, we're talking about inclusiveness and uh, equity uh, coming out of diversity. I think we should uh, look at it that way. Thank you. Thank you. It certainly uh, appears that, you know, fisheries and, and management and, you know, habitat destruction alike is sort of suffering from a fragmented approach. Uh, Cody, would you like to speak? Sure. Um, I think 
big picture, if you want to scientifically manage crustacean stocks, you need a few things. You need um, a good understanding of what is being removed from the ocean. You need some kind of understanding about what is in the ocean. You need some way to enforce what you want to come out of the ocean or stay in the ocean. And you need some way of predicting what the population would look like under different levels of, of exploitation. And it sounds like we're all at kind of different uh, areas um, or that we're all focusing on different areas in that process. And in Alaska right now, um, it's the last one that has been very tricky for us, the, the predicting the future. And that's the, the one that we're really spending a lot of time and effort on trying to understand how the changes in the physical environment of the Bering Sea and beyond are going to influence the, the productivity of the stocks that we're dealing with. Um, we have laboratory studies looking at how ocean acidification impacts the, the larval development of the commercial crab stocks. We have movement studies trying to understand how the crab move uh, on the shelf in the Bering Sea. We have growth studies trying to understand how growth is impacted in maturity. Um, so at the, our focus right now is trying, especially given the last few years and this last year in particular, is, is trying to predict and understand the, the impacts of climate change on um, our stocks so that our management can respond in advance. Um, we'll see how that works out because uh, we all know that prediction is hard, especially about the future. Uh, but one of the things that I think is interesting and one of the um, things that we haven't spent a lot of effort thinking about in Alaska is stock enhancement. And that's something that many of the other panelists here um, and their countries have much more experience than we do. Um, we've looked at it for um, a king crab species, but um, it seems like the enhancement programs that seem to have some effect work with uh, shorter lived species and these king crab live a, a rather long time. Um, regardless, I think that is one of the things that we might be able to do to try and uh, enhance the socioeconomic benefits in Alaska if we continue to see um, populations of commercially exploited crab on their way down. Great, yeah, perhaps you could take a salmon approach with uh, you know, the enormous hatchery releases. Uh, thank you all for your, your interesting perspectives. Uh, well, it's gonna get a little bit technical here. Um, so as sort of a mix of scientists, conservationists and managers all, uh, what sort of developing solutions uh, or upcoming solutions do you foresee? So how are sciences incorporated in the everyday management of these super important species? Uh, is it mandated by law or is it merely taken as sort of a, an assessment uh, on the side? Uh, what might be some novel technical solutions uh, that we could use to promote and safeguard the sustainability of these fisheries? And what are the, uh, or sorry, the, are the largest crustacean fisheries uh, data rich or data poor? Um, obviously this will, this will vary a lot uh, across countries and even across species uh, within countries, but what solutions do you foresee to improve data availability or perhaps guide management uh, in the presence of a, of a data poor species? Um, let's see, maybe Sunling, would you care to go first? Well, thanks, uh, Nathan. So, uh, so this, uh, for the data, uh, for the science and, uh, and data case, I, I would say for uh, the uh, Chinese crustacean fisheries, there's always a data deficiency. Uh, I know that, that that's a common challenge for most uh, uh, countries, uh, but uh, I guess in uh, China, that's, that's uh, fairly acute. So for all, we, uh, uh, I think we have uh, uh, around uh, over a hundred uh, species of crustaceans of uh, commercial value. Uh, uh, if you look at the Chinese uh, fisheries statistics uh, yearbook, uh, only seven uh, species or species groups, uh, their landings are recorded. Uh, so including gazami crab, uh, 
mantis shrimp, uh, <coughs> insect shrimp, uh, etc. And, and uh, in most cases, these are not species specific, but uh, at the best species group uh, specific. So in these cases, uh, uh, and, and uh, many commercially uh, important species like the deeper, warmer water shrimp, they are, uh, they are, they are not even captured uh, in those yearbooks. So they, this pose uh, extreme, uh, a very high challenge for, uh, for uh, guided uh, management measures, actions, or, or policy uh, orientations. Uh, so what are the normal uh, technolo uh, technology uh, solutions? So one uh, possible, uh, I think uh, the uh, Chinese government is right now uh, uh, promoting like a port port based uh, management measures so that's uh, so uh, that can be potentially a good tool to improve the uh, uh, the the data collection uh, from the uh, landing levels uh, uh, and also there's a uh, there are new technologies for uh, uh, including uh, electronic uh, observer uh, uh, electronic monitoring and and there there are electronic reporting now the challenges is uh, are how to uh, customize those new challenge uh, new technologies to uh, for the for the users so ultimately is uh, the users are the features uh, which tend to have a uh, uh, lower kind of education background so they uh, these tools need to be adapted uh, for their their most convenient use uh, and that uh, they, uh, there need uh, to be a necessary consideration of the fisheries uh, managers, particularly those uh, those uh, those uh, uh, fisheries managers uh, working in the in the forefront uh, in the fisheries management. How to make sure they can uh, use these tools uh, to to get the uh, uh, most accurate data uh, and. Uh, uh, in the meantime, we uh, I think the uh, there's a possibility we can improve the data accuracy uh, by two means. One is uh, incentivize fishers to uh, uh, and and uh, use uh, their uh, local eco ecological knowledge better. Uh, for example, when uh, when uh, uh, I was talking to a uh, fisher in uh, in the Bohai Bay, so one of China's. Uh, Largest base close to Beijing. Uh, that fisher to, uh, informed me that uh, the uh, he knows uh, he he sees the most uh, kind of a uh, uh, effective uh, approach to rebuild probably the Gazami swimming crab, the most uh, uh, commercially important crustacean. One thing that uh, area is actually to protect their wintering stock, uh, which they they have a winter uh, aggregation in the deeper water. Of the uh, Bohai Bay, whereas those uh, clam dredgers, they uh, use a deep rig, uh, uh, use a rig to rig the clams, and uh, uh, they, uh, in the meantime, they take most of the winter, uh, wintering uh, populations of the Gazami screaming crab, uh, which otherwise would uh, would breed uh, in the spring, uh, early summertime. So that's very destructive uh, to the to the stock. Then I, I was wondering how to take best advantage of those uh, local economic, ecological knowledge with, with our science. And, uh, and then together we, uh, for the NGOs uh, and the researchers and, uh, and the fishers to advocate for a stronger, uh, more stock uh, specific customized uh, uh, conservation management measures. So that's one way. Another is uh, uh, taking advantage of market uh, advantage of a uh, seafood traceability system, uh, large data, uh, and uh, using the uh, like the electronic commerce platforms and the customs data to help verify uh, the landing data, the trade data. That will uh, allow us to get a more precise kind of a data set uh, to uh, uh, to compensate, uh, to complement the current uh, kind of a relatively deficient and the less precise uh, data collection mechanism. Uh, so those are some of the tips. Great, thank you. Uh, very interesting to hear what you have to say about sort of incorporating both Fisher and even distributor uh, 
data streams to sort of supplement uh, biological data. Uh, maybe Tree or Nawadi, would you care to go next? Okay. Uh, well, the first question regarding the uh, how are the science incorporated into the everyday management of crustacean fisheries and science and science permitted by law? I think uh, all forms uh, of fisheries uh, management or fisheries management plans are required to be based on science in Indonesia and is explained and mandated by laws. <clears throat> and also there are several rules governing business research activities and also how these uh, activities should be carried out. And one thing that often could be done is communicating science-based analysis to uh, the policy, make, uh, to the policy maker, I mean, and uh, physics management for, uh, for example, uh, the stock assessment data uh, led by Research Institute for Marine Fisheries or Bali Research Prekalanaut in Bahasa, uh, which is evaluated by National Commission Office Stock Assessment. And then uh, this commission uh, produce recommendation on, for example, uh, MSY, uh, TAC, and stock status to the minister uh, and the national fisheries manager and use uh, this recommendation to inform uh, development of uh, the fisheries management. And then the, for the second question, uh, I think uh, some, novel, uh, some novel technical solution that might be needed, uh, that might be needed are uh, maybe first uh, technology for enforcement to detect uh, illegal destructing fishing gear and then technolo technology to enforce designated close areas to protect, to protect juveniles and then maybe technology such as the, the use of onboard and or uh, surveillance camera to better estimate uh, the fishing effort all year round and then uh, technology, technology to support uh, traceability from the fisher level all the way through the supply chains to exports that could uh, encourage a price differentiation based on, on product quality for a sample uh, large size uh, of crustacea. And then the last, uh, the last question, uh, solution to regarding the poor data, right? A uh, solution to improve uh, the data availability, availability and uh, quality uh, in Indonesia, there are some actions. Uh, first, uh, first action is uh, uh, are, uh, we already developed uh, some strategies for data collection. And for instance, um, we already developed the uh, eBRPL system based on port sampling and building uh, data collection system and with this uh, focus on stock assessment purposes. And then uh, we developed the uh, e-logbook data, and then the, we already developed the uh, observer onboard program. And then the, maybe the second action uh, is to try to involve the, all stakeholders, include scientists, universities, NGOs, private sectors, middlemen, user, et cetera, uh, in data collection using a standardized data collection format uh, with good synergy and led, and led by uh, government. Uh, for the, the third action, I think uh, we can uh, encourage a local government uh, to develop action plan that include uh, data collection, uh, adopt, the, uh, adopt the action plan legally and distribute uh, widely, I think. And uh, maybe for the last governance uh, structures to promote and uh, support management need uh, to be put in place and the empower uh, co-management. Great, thank you. Uh, it certainly seems to be a trend, uh, you know, the need for additional stakeholder engagement really across a lot of these fisheries. Yes. Uh, maybe Cody would care to speak next? Sure. Um, so 
in the U.S., uh, we are mandated to provide optimal yield. And as um, part of that mandate in Alaska, as um, the crab plan team, which reviews the science that is used to determine if optimal yield is being provided, meets three times a year to review um, new science related to the species that we're managing um, and talk about the assessments and data that we use to manage the stocks. Um, in terms of novel technical solutions, one of the things that we're focused on recently is um, a, a standardized stock assessment method that can be used for all of the stocks that we have. And uh, we're developing a software platform. So if there are any of you out there that are in the market for a, a software to uh, try to assess your crustacean stocks with, get in touch with me. Um, some of the other novel technical solutions I think that are, are being batted around are uh, unmanned drones doing collecting data. We've used sail drones to collect information on movement of crab in the Bering Sea, um, which was pretty exciting to watch. Um, Using satellite data to better inform some of our modeling efforts is, is a big push and um, electronic observer monitoring on fishing vessels is also, I think, something that will be more and more common as things go forward. Um, in, in Alaska, the, the largest crustacean fisheries, I think, would be considered quite data rich. Um, Across the nation, though, I think you might make the case that they're both data rich and data poor. Lobster, I think you would probably consider as data rich based on the pokings around that I've done with its assessments. But um, Dungeness crab, which I think comes in right behind lobster in terms of the value of the fishery, might be considered data poor. And on the West Coast, the, the Dungeness crab fisheries are, measure, are managed by a, a, a season, a size, and a sex regulation. And that's it. And um, within that management system, the exploitable crabs, so, so the male crabs that are larger than a bigger than a certain size, have experienced uh, exploitation rates of 90% for the last uh, maybe four decades in some areas. So I, I guess I bring that up just to put out there that it's not, depending on the life history of the animal and the um, effectiveness of your enforcement, it's not always necessary to have tons of data um, to manage a fishery sustainably. And I think Dungeness crab on the West Coast is a, a fairly good example of that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. Zach, here to close us out. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, as to the first question, how are the sciences incorporated into the everyday? Oh, I think, where are we now? I think I lost you. Yeah, uh, in the Philippines, we have um, a new, uh, uh, from based on the review of the last fisheries, so the new enact enactment of the revised fisheries code, the, uh, the government mandates the setting of uh, hard reference points and harvest control rules for all uh, 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 species to be managed. So it's there, we're still grappling on how to proceed with it, but uh, we're, we're working towards it. Now, similarly, uh, from the aquaculture perspective, I think I think uh, management of farms needs to become a national policy rather than a fragmented approach by the local government unit and to be implemented by the local government units under harmonized sets of uh, best practices. For example, like carrying capacity, regular monitoring of culture areas. On the second question, what are the novel technical solutions that might help promote or safeguard sustainability? I think there are two important considerations, considering that the fishery, station fisheries in the country is small scale. We need to have a very uh, efficient catch documentation system. So the, the fisheries agency here regularly collects, uh, regularly collects landing data. 
okay? But because crustaceans are generally fast growing, they have high exploitation rates. So we need something, we need a, a catch documentation system that is efficient when you have to collect, store, analyze, and even communicate the results within a short period of time. This is, this is, uh, this is uh, the reality that we, um, so some of the data we have collected, for example, uh, lagged by maybe four, five years. So, uh, so we need to, to improve on that. Similarly, fleet monitoring systems, like, you know, uh, vessel monitoring system, radar systems, or whatever. We need those because we have the tiny vessels and they are dispersed all over the archipelago and they land everywhere. So we need to have a handle on both the landings and the fleet in order for us to be able to really capture what is happening to, to the fisheries and be able to uh, develop um, a good uh, regulation around it. Now onto the last question is, are the station fisheries data rich or data poor? I think this is mostly uh, data poor. Uh, the blue crabs uh, data, pro the blue crabs probably would have a better sense of data, but we need to really uh, be able to discern whether most of the data would be usable or not. That's why we need to really review on the methodologies that we are using, okay? Um, what solutions are there to improve data availability uh, or management with data for fisheries? You know, crustacean fisheries uh, can be managed straightforward based on the issues at hand. For example, for the blue crab, you have issues such as high bycatch rates and uh, ghost fishing because a lot of gillnets, for example, are, are overrun by legal trawlers. So these are the kind of, of solutions that the, the solutions are there. All we need to do is be able to provide a policy and implement them effectively. So those are the kind of, of, uh, of, of solutions that do not really need a large set of data or large scientific analysis. It's a pretty straightforward solutions that could contribute to its sustainability. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jose. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. A, a couple calls for sort of technological uh, the improvements on monitoring of, of you know these highly variable fisheries and, and fishery dynamics. Uh, for our final remark, uh, we're going to tackle climate change, uh, which is of course you know ever present, uh, <laughs> is you know a serious threat to ecological and economic health, basically wherever fisheries are concerned. So. If we could maybe do a quick discussion of some of the projected climate change impacts on crustacean fisheries in your country, uh, as well as potential adaptation strategies, um, and sort of what timeline these, these strategies are being considered on. And then this final question is just sort of a, a brain tingler. Uh, do you know of any sort of forward thinking strategies uh, that we could employ to mitigate potential climate-induced fishery changes? Uh, the example being, you know, if, if crab larvae are detrimentally affected by rising ocean temperatures, would it be possible to safeguard additional spawning stock biomass to sort of offset this uh, increased mortality? Uh, and it would be good if we could keep these responses pretty quick and snappy so that we have uh, just a little bit of time to, I've seen a few good questions in the Q&A. So uh, Cody, would you like to take the lead on this one? Sure, I'll be quick since I, I feel like all of my answers so far have included the words environmental change or climate change in them. Um, I'll maybe just one anecdote. Um, we, a group of researchers and I published a paper last year uh, predicting different changes in the distribution and productivity of the stocks that we're, that we're um, concerned with in the Bering Sea. And this year, looking at the survey data, it um, our predictions lined up fairly well with with what has happened. But uh, our predictions were for 20 years in the future, not one year in the future. And that that I think um, anecdote kind of encapsulates the urgency that we're thinking about a changing environment in the the northern latitudes right now. And I'll just leave it at that for now, so we can get to discussion. Certainly. Um, Song Lin? Uh, sure, I, I think it's uh, certainly indisputable that uh, climate change is uh, affecting uh, uh, 
lives uh, on land and uh, uh, in the in the seas and oceans. And uh, uh, for crustaceans, I think there are uh, uh, before we can we can really uh, realize this uh, uh, like zero uh, emission, uh, we have to take more proactive measures to uh, uh, to mitigate uh, the uh, unwanted effect. Uh, uh, effects of a uh, uh, bycatch on crustacean uh, fisheries. Uh, uh, I would say thinking of a uh, uh, most, uh, uh, at least the most of the commercial valuable uh, crustaceans uh, life history uh, in China's uh, uh, inshore waters or continental shelves. So there are uh, measures uh, can be taken include uh, uh, better conserving and even restoring some of the crystal critical coastal uh, wetlands, uh, mangroves, uh, eelgrass bed, uh, uh, as Gingo said, uh, and, uh, uh, so the, and the base uh, estuaries, those are critical either breeding or nursery grounds uh, for the crustaceans. Uh, and it's also uh, very important to monitor uh, the life history changes of those uh, crustaceans uh, in the context in response to the climate change. So, for example, certain uh, crustacean might have a diff, uh, might might change their wintry aggregation behaviors uh, or migrate, migration path, uh, pathways, and uh, that deserve uh, adjusted uh, conservation monitor uh, measures. Uh, and then, the uh, in the meantime, I would say the climate change is also severely affecting the interactions of the uh, rivers and and the seas. So many of the crustaceans, they uh, love the estuary uh, area as they need the estuary area as a, as a, a breeding and a, and a nursery grounds. And uh, then in this case, probably it would, would be helpful to consider eco flows and improve the interaction of, uh, of the rivers and, and the seas uh, for some of the kind of a more uh, uh, Kind of a marketry or anadromous or catadromous uh, crustacean species. So those are the uh, some of the thinkings here. Thank you, Songlin. Yeah, it's um, you know with the extremely variable life histories of these different crustaceans and each of them having, of course, different uh, requirements for different life stages. Uh, they're sort of doubly vulnerable. Uh, Jose, would you care to or speak next? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Discuss projected climate change impacts on crustacean fisheries. I think uh, we can do some scenario setting here, but we barely understand how the future scenario would roll out in the country. We do have some, some, some estimates, uh, mostly on fish, but we never have uh, anything on crustaceans. And come to think of it, they are, I think, one of the most vulnerable given that we are expecting, you know, uh, acidification of our oceans and uh, uh, high uh, sea surface temperatures to, to act. And I think the, the best adaptation strategies that we can do would be to really rebuild our stocks, you know, make them really, uh, you, know, you know, just bring them to a level where they are, there, there's more of them to be able to resist, you know, uh, as, uh, you know events that are really catastrophic. Uh, I think that's one. The second one would be really uh, ensure that the habitats where all these crustaceans are dependent on would be managed accordingly as well. Okay. And, and the third, I think, would be, you know, we need to understand better what is happening and what will the future look like. Okay. So we have to start, you know, investing on research, investing on, on models that would guide our, um, you know, uh, our bureaucrats to see uh, what we need to do, what kind of species we need to uh, protect uh, and, and retain, and what species do we need to abandon given all this scenario setting. I think that's all for what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tri Yernawati, would you care to close out our discussion here? Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, okay, for the first question, uh, thanks. Uh, I believe that uh, Indonesia hasn't had any research uh, on climate change uh, impact to crustacean fisheries, actually. And, and then, uh, however, I may be, but however, I may be wrong. 
Uh, but uh, for the first question, in my opinion, uh, generic suggestions are very sensitive to changing environmental conditions, so uh, are likely to be impacted by climate change. Uh, but however, uh, given their feeding habits are very widely, including, scav uh, including scavengers and uh, field of feeders and active predators, um, may make them uh, more adaptable. And then uh, there is uh, anecdotal evidence uh, from Pro Lampung province in 2020 that uh, high precipitation uh, impacts the flow of fresh water to the ocean and that uh, this is a reduced the salinity. And then this phenomenon uh, has a great impact on blue swimming crab capability to meet uh, and breed and move to near shore. Uh, as the result, uh, there is shift on uh, blue swimming crab precision. And should this happen uh, frequently, uh, I think it will uh, impact the blue swimming crab fishery in Lampung, for example, this is a decrease uh, in catch. And for the, the second question uh, regarding the timeline, I think it is difficult for me to answer because uh, as I mentioned uh, before that, uh, we didn't uh, carry out research on climate change impact to uh, crustacean species yet, but uh, uh, to, uh, to my knowledge, uh, Indonesia has NDCs. Uh, this is the national determined uh, contributions uh, to reduce uh, national emission and adapt to the impact of uh, climate change, uh, but they do not include a strategies focus on fisheries. So uh, getting management in place is key to safeguard uh, climate change impacts, such as uh, habitat, for, uh, habitat protection for fisheries. And then for the last question, uh, uh, yes, uh, I think it is possible uh, forward thinking strategy uh, that might be suitable for acoustic management in Indonesia uh, to mitigate uh, climate induced changes, could, uh, maybe could include uh, use of science to inform the management, uh, safeguarding habitats and ecosystem health, and also anticipate uh, any future uh, predicted change. And also maybe, uh, however, uh, I personally think that Indonesia hasn't really thought uh, the climate change effect of uh, crustacean fisheries. Uh, it might need time uh, to risk government uh, and fisheries agency, I think, uh, related to start thing uh, on precaution step on climate change, especially on crustacean fisheries. I think that's my answer. Great, thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, I think I'd like to use the remainder of our time to get into some sort of audience questions. Uh, so audience members, if you have not yet typed any questions into the chat, uh, or into the Q&A section specifically, uh, please take a moment and we'll, we'll answer as many as we can. And uh, Tree Nawadi has already been very busy answering a few uh, personally directed questions. So thank you, Tree, uh, for that. I think so that we might uh, better all see each other's faces, I will stop sharing at this point. And I think it was the very first one I thought was pretty interesting. Um, so Rich Lincoln asks, uh, given sort of the example of very high variability of abundance uh, that Cody was talking about with snow crab, how do the panelists view the role of marine survival or recruitment conditions versus exploitation in driving abundance variability, especially with species with short life histories? Uh, so I suppose to, to summarize uh, what they're asking, it would be you know, to what extent uh, are these fisheries necessarily responsible or which is having the greater impact? Um, and to this, I think whoever would like to speak first could just pipe up because uh, you all have different levels of experience with some of these questions. Can I answer it live? Certainly. Yes, I think the question is uh, well placed because uh, that's uh, some of the key things that we're struggling with crustacean fisheries. The, uh, and, and the high variability of recruitment uh, has something to do too with uh, how the fisheries react to, 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 to the situation. And 
very often, very often it's the distribution of the larvae and the settlement of the larvae that are critical. Okay. At times when you have a really um, a currents generated by the monsoon and along these times when you have so many, you know, the frequency and intensity of typhoons are affecting the general circulation. You know, um, I personally believe, although I don't have any scientific evidence yet, that, you know, and they're occurring exactly at the time the typhoons uh, and storms occur at the time when they are recruited, majorly recruited into the fishery. So they end up somewhere that is deep that they cannot uh, that, that survive all this. So uh, and probably it will be a nice uh, study to look into the relationship of, of those things between storms and typhoons and circulations and uh, uh, recruitment. But that, those are data that we need to be collected yet. And, uh, and those are the kind of data that uh, generally are not available in the country unless you have a PhD student working. Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to respond to this particular question? Uh, I'll just say that uh, recruitment dynamics is one of my favorite things to think about. Um, and crab, I've tried to explain the dynamics for snow crab more than a couple of times. Um, and we, each time, um, not this most recent time, but the, the times before you get new data, the relationships you identified break down. And it's been a bit of a, a frustrating exercise for me because at the beginning of my PhD, I had thought that uh, I would figure out what was driving recruitment of snow crab. I could project that into the future and then we'd know exactly what to do with the fishery. And uh, 10 years on at trying to make that happen, I have yet to make that happen. Um, so I think that's going to be one of the central challenges. I haven't stopped trying, mind you. Uh, I don't know what that says about uh, my uh, ability to learn from previous mistakes, but um, I think it's a really interesting question. And I think there's gonna be a lot of time and effort spent on answering that for various crustacean stocks around the world. Thank you. Sort of pulling between what you and, and Jose said, it certainly seems like a managing the fishery side of things is definitely easier than necessarily understanding the total dynamics of uh, recruitment for some of these species. So we're sort of forced to choose one over the other. Uh, Songling, would you like to speak? Sure, uh, I uh, can fully agree uh, with the reach the, uh, the, and quality, the challenges of, uh, of those uh, <coughs> crustacean fisheries, particularly for those uh, shorter-lived uh, crustacean species. Uh, I, I would say probably if, if we see this as a, a, a part of our natural capital, then it's always a, a, a good precautionary approach to uh, uh, set aside some of the natural capital, uh, capitals as a, a, a reserve. So there's a, particularly in, con in the context of uh, unpredictable or, or, uh, climate change uh, impacts. So uh, I would say seasonal, uh, uh, closures, kind of a spatial planning, uh, and uh, uh, certain uh, marine protected areas network, if that can cover certain kind of a key breeding uh, winter in nursery, nursery grounds uh, of those uh, uh, short-lived crustacean species, uh, that will uh, uh, increase their chance uh, to maintain a uh, more healthy uh, stock as they can uh, they, they do have the magic to replenish and, and they even benefit uh, from uh, overfishing of uh, their fin fish uh, predators or competitors, but they, they can fall victim to uh, overfishing uh, as well. So always to be more precautionary and, and uh, setting aside some good reserves for our uh, natural capitals uh, would always uh, uh, be ben beneficial or promising. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Fir Nawadi, would you like to speak to this, or we have some other questions as well? I think I already answered by typing. Okay. Um, Cody, you have a specifically addressed question, um, which I guess I can answer live. Uh, how are you monitoring whether or not the existing policies are working, uh, and are you measuring sort of the efficiency of these policies? Well, uh, that's the question that we ask um, every time 
we meet three times a year is whether or not our catch has exceeded the, the acceptable biological catches that we laid out. So that's a, a feedback loop that happens every year within our management process. And the, the efficiency is a, an, an interesting question because there are lots of resources expended, uh, both collecting the data, um, analyzing the data, enforcing whatever um, management actions come out the other end. Um, and I guess you've got the kind of the quota based system that we use in the Bering Sea for snow crab and red king crab. And you can compare that to maybe Dungeness crab where there's much less effort that goes into the, the management of it. Um, I don't know of any studies that we've done that have looked specifically at the, the variation in efficiency across species. And I think one of the um, real tricky things there is getting um, appropriate counterfactuals to, to compare your, your outcomes of management to. So I, it's an interesting question, but I don't, I don't have a good answer for it. Certainly it's, uh, you know, sort of categorizing your own efficiency is uh, super challenging because, you know, you're looking at it from your own perspective. Um, and maybe this sort of ties back into all this talk about stakeholders and how they're perceiving a lot of their, a lot of the success of these measures. Um, would anyone else care to, it's an interesting topic. So if anyone else would like to pipe in, please do. So I'd like to provide an answer to the question of Amber von Harten. So how can a small scale fishers be engaged in, in the management? And I think uh, one of the key successful uh, activities, not for crustaceans though, but for other species have been the, what we call the participatory research, where the, the, the fishers themselves are, are trained and engaged in, in data collections, okay? That, uh, that are actually uh, contributing to the uh, data collections being uh, undertaken by, by the government. And this, this, has, uh, this is an advantage of raising the awareness among fishers of what needs to be done. They are aware of what is happening, okay? And, and they, are actually, they will actually become your ambassadors on how to really relate the, the management that would, uh, uh, that would result in the analysis uh, that Part of the data were contributed by them. I think this is a, a very, uh, a very novel way of uh, approaching the, the questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank uh, you for your response, Songling. Do you have something to say? Sure, I can uh, add a bit. I think uh, uh, some of our uh, field conservation experience. Uh, uh, I think many. Uh, it's not unusual to see. Uh, uh, local uh, small-scale fishing community uh, leaders, they are very keen to, uh, uh, and they really want to be a stronger uh, steward uh, of, their, uh, of their resources. So there are several uh, enabling conditions or ob ob obstacles we have to help uh, them come, uh, <clears throat> help them address. So one, one is that the kind of uh, ownership uh, or, or uh, kind of a fishing right allocation. So right. Uh, it, whenever you, you have a kind of a open, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's no way. So uh, there's always a, a race to the bottom. So, uh, so no one would want to uh, fish with less effort uh, and with any kind of a more selectivity. Uh, but I think it's uh, probably part of the answer is how to, uh, uh, empower those small scale fishers to uh, 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 potentially use the uh, turf uh, concept of uh, EDF, uh, trying to allocate them uh, exclusive uh, fishing rights to certain fishing ground. And then that will create a natural incentive for them to better monitor, better manage uh, their stocks. And, and uh, <clears throat> another is uh, certainly a better, a stronger collaboration uh, between the uh, non-governmental uh, sectors and uh, and in partnership with the government, so the small-scale uh, fishing communities can always partner with the uh, scientists, uh, experts, and uh, and and with NGOs and uh, uh, 
And the third part would be uh, the market mechanism. So how to, uh, how to leverage the market, uh, the green kind of a sustainable seafood market to, to reward good practices of those uh, small scale fishing communities to reward their more responsible fishing method their stronger willingness to share data, their transparency, uh, social responsibility. I think th this is another uh, key kind of in enabling condition we can try to create. Thank you. Great. Uh, so we're about at the end of our time. Uh, there's only a few questions left. Uh, one of them is how can we sort of improve uh, the quality of fisheries data collection for uh, some of these data poor fisheries? And uh, Songling and a few others have sort of described, uh, you know, in engaging these stakeholders and maybe taking ecological knowledge or, uh, you know, fish or data streams. Um, so we have that. Uh, and then as well, a directly toward, towards uh, Dr. Inglis, um, a question on how you manage the, how the Philippines manages the lobster catch. Uh, and I think with if you guys have any final remarks on that, uh, and after that, we will have to probably close. Yeah, Harley's, uh, we plan to manage them. So that's where we are right now. And we did pass a, 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 a policy that bans the, uh, the selling, the capture and selling of the phylosoma larvae. We're at that level, but we haven't really uh, done yet on the question on the issues that I raised earlier on what decisions do we make? Do, do we let them settle? But basically the, the, the ban on, on the sale of the larvae, the phylosoma, leaves uh, actually is an answer that we would rather have it uh, settle on our coral reefs. But um, I have yet to see how, how the government would plan to really look into that uh, aspect of providing the correct habitat for this phylosoma because if they won't survive you might as well sell them uh, to get them. Uh, these are records coming from from uh, you know probably australia papua new guinea and solomon islands or palau and uh, that has something to be clarified here. great thank you uh, somebody did sneak in a final question about uh, how has COVID affected crustacean fisheries, but that uh, is such a broad topic that it may have to be its own webinar. Um, so I suppose with that, given we are out of time, I would like to sincerely thank our uh, panelists. Um, it's really been really a fascinating discussion. Um, and of course, if, if any in our audience have uh, more pressing questions, they can get in touch with me or the Crustacean Task Force uh, and we will do our best to answer all of your questions. Um, so thank you all uh, and have a, a lovely evening or start rest of your day, depending on your time zone. Um, and, uh, I think we're ready to close it out. Thank you, Nathan. And thank thank you, uh, fellow panelists. You too. It's good to see you all. Hope to see you in person sometime soon. See you. Bye-bye.